Yeah. Good question. How could, is there any way to make that, where do these correspond? Is there any way to find out where this new stuff corresponds in the book? No. <laughs> I'll tell you in just a sec. Okay, let's uh, get started. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here uh, tonight. Lord, we ask that you just open our hearts to what you have to show us tonight. Lord, I pray that you would um, just give me the words that I need to say uh, and that you would fix them before they get to the ears in this place. Lord, we ask that you bless those in our church that are hurting, that are lonely, that are sick. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would give us opportunity to minister and then you would give us courage to step out and do that. Thank you, Jesus, and it is in your precious name we pray. Amen. Um, let's see. Uh, the bad jokes. Uh, my dog, Mitten, ate my racket and shuttlecock this morning. Bad Mitten. Uh, my son's fourth birthday was today, but when he woke up in the morning, I didn't recognize him at first because I'd never seen him before. It was his fourth birthday. I hired a landscape gardener. He said he couldn't help. Uh, he said my lawn was portrait. It was a landscape gardener. But my lawn was... Where do seahorses sleep at night? In barnacles. What's the difference between a camera and a foot? A camera has photos and a foot has five toes. Photos and five toes. Uh, I hung up a copy of the U.S. Constitution on my wall. I call it the Declaration of Independence. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as I said, if you're watching on the video when I pick up the study, that's when we're going to start so you can fast forward through the bad jokes. And uh, in any case, we're continuing our study. And uh, if you have your book on page 106, uh, you're going to kind of see what I just gave you in your handout. Um, as you may recall, I put the book together in about three days uh, so that we would have something for you to have in your hand while we did the study. And uh, since then, I have added a whole bunch of stuff. And so in the handout that you have in your hand today, we're on page 244, but in your book, you'll see that uh, some of that same stuff is on page 106. So you can see I've added, uh, what's that, 138 pages or something like that. So you can see I put a whole bunch of junk in here. So addition two is going to be pretty good, or at least it's going to have a whole bunch more pages. So do you see where we are? 106. So that's where uh, we are. So you can put some notes in there. I went ahead and printed out a few pages for you because we're going to have so much to go through that I thought it would be easier for you if I printed it out. I hate to uh, use up the paper and toner, but I figured it would help you. So anyway, we're continuing through our survey of the Bible and we're continuing, I guess we've, this is our third lesson maybe on the New Testament kind of done some overview and today we have some more overview and we'll probably get into uh, actually looking at Matthew and uh, maybe Matthew and Mark. So uh, does anybody have any questions before we get started? Hopefully Bible questions, but I'll take anything you got. No questions. Must mean I'm a really good teacher. Okay, good. So, um, our ultimate syllabus, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So which parts of the Bible apply to us? All of it. All of it. So if you, if you want to make some doctrine, if you want to look up some doctrine, you want to figure something out, you got to take the whole Bible into view when you're trying to figure it out. Now, it may not, the specific thing you're looking at may or may not specifically apply to you personally, but if you're gonna understand the Bible, you gotta take the whole thing to understand it. Uh, a couple of things to notice here. Reproof is for wrong conduct and correction is for wrong doctrine. 
So if you want to, if you want to note that, um, that's how uh, God works that. I also heard the other day something about that. Um, we don't discipline for mistakes. We discipline for rebellion. Have you thought about that? If you think about raising your children, we don't discipline for mistakes. We discipline for rebellion. And I hadn't, hadn't really thought about that uh, that much. And I kind of thought about it um, as we raised our daughter. I thought back to when she um, r- brushed the car up against the side of the garage when she drove it in there one time. And I remember when I got home, she and my wife just knew I was going to kill her uh, because she had, you know, messed up the side of the car when she did that. And I got home and I said, well, you know, don't do it again. And they were very surprised that I didn't just blow my top. And, you know, just thinking about it, you, you don't punish for mistakes. You punish for rebellion. And I started thinking about the way that God treats us And he doesn't punish for mistakes. He punishes for rebellion. Now, there are consequences for mistakes. uh, And there's also consequences for rebellion too, right? And God sometimes uh, removes the consequences. He sometimes minimizes the consequences. And sometimes he just walks with us through the consequences. Everybody okay with that? And so anyway, as we're looking at this, reproof is for wrong conduct and correction is for wrong doctrine. Uh, And so anyway, we look at um, uh, Romans is uh, about doctrine, uh, and 1 and 2 Corinthians is reproof, Galatians is correction, Ephesians is doctrine, Philippians reproof, Colossians corrections, 1 and 2 Thessalonians is doctrine, and you can kind of see all that right there you see that uh, there are 21 interpretive letters in the New Testament. So you start off with the five books of history in the New Testament. Those are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. Those are history, right? Uh, How many books of history do we have in the Old Testament? Five books, right? And then you have some interpretation, and then you have... Uh, some apocryphal, like Daniel and that kind of stuff. So if you kind of look at it, you're going to see that the the structure of the Old Testament is very similar to the structure of the New Testament, which is also quite interesting. You got 21 interpretive letters. You'll see that there are 14 written by Paul. Uh, Hebrews is not signed. We attribute that to Paul, but he didn't sign it. We believe that he didn't sign that one on purpose. Um, The question is, why in the world didn't he sign it on purpose? Not exactly sure, but we believe he didn't sign it on purpose because he wanted it to be accepted by some people um, and they might not have accepted it if they knew that he wrote it. Uh, And so we believe maybe he um, didn't sign it because uh, on purpose. Um, If Paul did not write Hebrews on purpose, then, I mean, if Paul didn't write Hebrews, then what can we say about that? We can say that's quite the miracle because it really sounds like Paul. And it really has a lot of the same stuff that Paul said in the others of his letters. And so the Holy Spirit was seriously at work there uh, because it really matches up with other things that Paul said. You can see there on the epistles where it talks about what each one is about, Romans, uh, definitive doctrines. If you want to talk about doctrine, Romans is the book. And if you really want to get into serious doctrine, Romans chapter 8 is the chapter you want to look at. Okay, There is not a better chapter in the Bible about doctrine than Romans chapter 8. If I was going off to be imprisoned somewhere, and I could only take one chapter of the Bible, I would take Romans chapter 8 with me. That would be it. That would be the thing. Um, It is the big deal. Romans chapter 8. Romans is the definitive doctrine. 1 and 2 Corinthians is the order in the church. Galatians is law versus grace. 
<laughs> Ephesians, well, let me go back. Galatians, law versus grace. Do you realize that grace uh, deteriorates to law? Um, if, you, if you think about it, in most situations where people start off with grace, you, you see this a lot in churches where they start off with grace and as tradition starts to eat away at the church, you start getting all these rules and you start getting tradition and you start getting this legalistic stuff and you see that the law just eats away at the grace. Have you seen, you understand what I'm saying? Um, you'll see that a lot. In any case, law versus grace in Galatians, Ephesians, the mystery of the church. And so in the Old Testament, it talked about the mystery. The mystery in the Old Testament is the church. Um, in the Old Testament, uh, it talked a lot about how the Hebrews were going uh, were God's people and that the mystery was coming and the mystery and you hear about the mystery. The mystery was the fact that the Gentiles were going to be saved too. Um, and just to, to re-emphasize that, how are people saved in the New Testament? Belief in Jesus Christ, exactly. Through faith in Jesus Christ alone. There's nothing else, right? Just faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by works, right? We, we, have, we do works. We do good deeds. Why? Because we love Christ. And it's a result of our relationship in Jesus, with Jesus Christ. I, I do things for my wife because I love her. I don't do things to love her. I love her, so I do things for her. I love Christ, so I do things for him. My, my works are a result of something that's on the inside. So, um, <clears throat> we are saved by grace through faith in the New Testament. Turns out, everybody in the Old Testament is saved the exact same way. They're saved by grace through faith. Turns out, everybody in the tribulation is going to be saved by the same way. Everybody who's ever been saved is saved the exact same way. So we find out that the mystery that is talked about in the Bible is the fact that the Gentiles are being saved, and that was something that was, was basically a surprise. Um, the Philippians uh, is resources and suffering. It's interesting that Philippians is about resources and suffering because it's all about rejoicing, right? That's what Philippians is about. If you uh, would like a copy of my book about Philippians, it's about rejoicing. Um, and it's a, it's a good study because it reminds you to rejoice. Colossians is Christ preeminent. First and second Thessalonians is the second coming. Uh, first and second Timothy is pastoral advice and so is Titus. Philemon is intercessory example and Hebrews is the new covenant. Then we have the Hebrew Christian epistles, which is James Faith demonstrated. Uh, James is great. Uh, uh, you can also see my book on James. It's called um, Roll Up Your Sleeves with James or something like that. I can't remember what it is. Uh, James is an interesting book. It talks about which is more important, faith or works. Turns out if you have faith, then you will have works. Because if you love somebody, you will serve them. If you love Christ, you will serve them. Um, one of uh, Pastor Buckner Fanning, a longtime pastor at Trinity Baptist, used to say, which is more important, the right wing of the airplane or the left wing of the airplane in terms of faith and works? And when I was in Senegal, uh, West Africa, uh, I was going to use that phrase and I was teaching a Bible study and I was going to say, which is more important, the left wing of the airplane or the right wing? And I'm looking around and these people have never seen an airplane up close. <laughs> And that's when I remembered, uh, which is more important, the left wing of a bird or the right wing of a bird? Um, and so that was good, too. So there you go. Also, when I was in India, I told the big mouth frog uh, joke. And they really liked that. And I ended up telling my mom about that. And she said, well, why didn't you tell him about the lawyer in the bar? And I'm like, that's not going to work in India. Are you crazy? In any case, uh, James is about faith demonstrated. First Peter, persecuted church. Second Peter, the coming apostasy. Uh, First John is about love. Second John, false teachers. Third John, preparation of helpers. 
Third John, apostasy. Uh, what's apostasy? Anybody remember? Falling away. A falling away. Okay. Apostasy is you know about God, but you fall away. Okay. An apostate is somebody who knows about God and knows about his love, but falls away. Can a person who is truly a son of God, who has truly accepted Jesus Christ, become an apostate? No, you can't. Okay? If you're truly saved, you cannot become an apostate. You can do apostate-like things. You can commit apostate-like sins, but you cannot become an apostate. Once you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you cannot become an apostate. An apostate is somebody who tastes of the Holy Spirit, who knows what God is about, who knows what the Holy Spirit is about. Uh, you might consider a person like that who is somebody who comes to church and tastes the love and the Holy Spirit that's going on here, but then walks away from it, okay? That would be an apostate. Uh, Jude is about apostasy. Apocalypse, uh, a revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. What's the name of the last book in the Bible? Revelation. Revelation. One revelation. It's not revelations. It's revelation. It's the, you read the first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ to Jesus Christ given by God the Father. Okay? It's one revelation. Okay? If somebody says revelations, they have not been in my Bible study class and they have not spent time studying the book. Okay? That's how you know that they haven't studied it. It's the revelation. It's not revelations. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ to Jesus Christ, which is interesting and uh, we're headed that way. Okay, questions about the New Testament there. How many books in the New Testament? 27. Everybody okay with that? How many books in the Old Testament? 39. How many books in the Bible? 66. Uh, sure seems like there ought to be 70. Turns out Psalms is really five books. So there really are 70 books in the Bible. Everybody okay? Okay, good. All right, uh, chronological order of the epistles. You can see there uh, the year that they were written and where they were written from. And so you can uh, read those. Um, there are 1,845 references in the Old Testament about the return of Christ to rule. Uh, 17 books give promi prominence to the event of Christ coming back to rule. 318 references in the New Testament uh, 216 chapters that talk about that. Uh, 23 of 27 books give prominence to the event. For every prophecy of Christ's first coming, there are eight uh, of his second coming. So there's like seven or eight prophecies about his second coming for every one prophecy of his first coming. Um, so uh, it's pretty important in the Bible. Uh, if you compare the rapture to the second coming, uh, first off, let's talk about the rapture. The rapture is believers meet Christ in the air in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, it's imminent. Uh, it, there's no precedent condition. So the rapture is when the believers meet Christ in the air. So the precedent condition is the number of the Gentiles. Right. So the Bible says uh, there were a couple of requirements for that. One was that Israel have their country back. And so the rapture couldn't happen before 1948 because that's when they got their country back. So that was the last requirement for the rapture. So it could really happen anytime since then. Uh, the Bible tells us that it will be uh, upon the fullness of the Gentiles. And that is the church, okay? And so uh, when the number clicks, the last person gets saved that's supposed to get saved, poof, the rapture will happen. The Bible tells us those who have died in Christ will poof, uh, will meet him in the air in the twinkling of an eye. How long is the twinkling of an eye? Well, it's the amount of time that it takes for a photon to pass through uh, the cornea of your eye, uh, which is 
um, the shortest amount of time, which is called a Planck. For those of you who might wonder, uh, time is actually digital. It's not variable. You can actually get to the shortest amount of time, which is called a Planck. Okay, uh, it's, it's the amount of time basically that it takes for a fo photon to pass through uh, the cor cornea of your eye. Uh, and it's gonna, it's a lot less than that. Um, poof, we're gonna be gone. So, so is the whole body gonna rise up or just their soul? Okay. Your soul's already there, and the body shows up. You get it, a glorified body, a resurrection body. So, if you're dead and if you're, buried, if you're, not dead, if you're not dead, if you're dead and buried, um, Poof, you're going to be there. Uh, your glorified body will be there. If you're alive, poof, you'll be there. So it we don't have exact details about how, how all that's going to happen. Um, I personally believe that the Bible says that uh, blood can't go to heaven. So I believe your blood and your clothes are going to stay here. And your body will be changed into a glorified body as you ascend to heaven. Okay? And so I believe that the um, tabloids and the news are, is going to say that aliens abducted millions of people and left our blood and our clothes here. And so it'll be pretty weird. Um, so we don't know exactly how all that's going to work, but the Bible says we're going to meet Jesus in the air. So the rapture... Uh, is not the second coming. The second coming is when Jesus actually puts his foot on the earth. So that's why we don't call it the second coming. We call it the rapture. And so everyone who's a believer will be taken off of the earth. The Holy Spirit, where's the Holy Spirit? He's inside of us, right? So there will be no one left on this earth that has the Holy Spirit in them. What kind of world will this be if there's no one left with the Holy Spirit in them? It'll be a pretty bad place. And if there's, you know, and if it really is, if our blood and our clothes are still here, it's going to be a pretty bad place. Um, and I've heard stories of airlines asking pilots if they're Christians and making sure that one pilot's not a Christian if the other one is and things like that. You know, who knows? Um, which is kind of ridiculous because if you think about how bad things are going to be, you know, having one pilot that's not a Christian and one that is is not is going to be the least of their worries. Um, in any case, uh, at the rapture, it's going to be poof uh, there. So Satan doesn't know when that's going to happen. He doesn't know how many believers it is for when that's going to happen. And so every time somebody gets saved, Satan has to look and see, is this it? And so the cool thing is, is that since 1948, Satan has been in shock treatment every time somebody gets saved. Uh, and so that's pretty cool. Um, in any case, the Antichrist is ready. Uh, Satan has the Antichrist ready uh, to go. And so after the rapture, uh, the tribulation will begin at some point. It doesn't begin exactly after the uh, rapture, it could, uh, but it doesn't necessarily begin exactly after the rapture. We don't have an exact timetable of that. Tribulation. I'm sorry? You're talking about the tribulation. The tribulation does not necessarily begin exactly after the rapture, but it probably will begin quite soon after. In any case, the rapture, uh, believers will meet Christ in the air in the twinkling of an eye. That'll be it. Uh, the second coming is when Christ comes and sets foot on the earth. That will happen at the end of the tribulation. The tribulation will be seven years. It'll be three and a half relatively good years, three and a half really, really bad years. Um, you'll not be able to kill yourself during the tribulation, uh, which is kind of a bad thing. Uh, if you find yourself here during the tribulation, you need to walk around sing, singing Jesus is Lord and see if you can get yourself killed for representing Christ because the alternative is going to be really bad. Uh, in any case, uh, there are some uh, comparison here of the rapture versus the second coming. 
The rapture is the translation of all believers, translation as in poof. The second coming is no translation at all. Rapture is translated saints go to heaven. Uh, second coming translated saints return to earth. So uh, there'll be an army of saints that come back to the earth. Rapture, earth is not judged. Second coming, earth is judged. Righteousness is established. Uh, rapture is imminent any moment. Uh, it's signless. There's not a specific sign that's going to happen. Um, second coming is follows a definite predicted signs, including the tribulation. Um, uh, rapture, not in the Old Testament. Uh, in other words, it does not talk about the rapture in the Old Testament. Why doesn't it talk about the rapture in the Old Testament? Because it has nothing to do with the Hebrews. It has everything to do with the church. Okay? Right? Are there Hebrews who are believers? Yes. Yes, there are. And so it, it, it includes them, right? If they're believers, they're going. But... It, it's not about the Hebrews, it's about the church. And so it was not talked about in the Old Testament because it's not about the Hebrews, it's about the church, which is the New Testament. Okay? Everybody all right? All right. Not talked about in the Old Testament. Second coming is predicted in the Old Testament. Why is that? Because it's about the Hebrews. What is the purpose of the tribulation? It's to give the Hebrews the Jews, one last chance. That's the purpose of the tribulation. Okay? That's what. That's the whole purpose of the tribulation. Will there be Gentiles that get saved during the tribulation? Yes. Will there be Hebrews that get saved during the tribulation? Yes. But the purpose of the tribulation is for to give the Hebrews one last chance. And we're going to see that when we start studying Revelation, uh, that the Bible says it's not going to be till they turn as a nation and beg Jesus to come back. That's when they turn as a nation and beg Jesus to come back. That is what the purpose of the tribulation is. Uh, rapture is believers only. Second coming affects all people on the earth. Rapture is before the day of wrath. Uh, the second coming concludes the day of wrath. Uh, rapture, no reference to Satan. Second coming, Satan is bound. Rapture, Christ comes for his own. Uh, second coming, Christ comes with his own. Rapture, he comes in the air. Second coming, he comes to the earth. Uh, rapture, he claims his bride. Second coming, he comes with his bride. Rapture, he only his own see him. Um, Second coming, every knee, uh, every eye shall see him. Uh, rapture, the tribulation begins. Second coming, the millennial kingdom begins. Who has a question? I have a question. Okay. Uh, what do you think of some of the criticisms of the pre trib rapture position? I know I've heard of one where some people say that when you look at maybe church history, Pre-trib seems to be more recent, and that maybe historically the church hasn't believed it. And so there are some people who would say, why would it be something that's revealed only more recently versus maybe previously? Do you have any thoughts on something like that? Chuck, that's what it says, that if you understand that the church is the body of Christ, and you look at the tribulation as the wrath of God, it can't intersect the body of So, so um, when we start looking at Revelation, we're going to look at the seven letters to the churches. And when you look at the seven letters to the churches, you're going to see church history there. Um, you're going to see that the first letter really describes the early church, the first, the, the first century church. And you're going to see that the second letter kind of talks about the next in history, the church, and so on and so forth. And you can even see the, the Dark Ages church and so on and so forth. And you get to, I think it's like Philadelphia or something, and, and you get on there. Um, and as you look at that, and finally the last letter, uh, the last church um, 
you can kind of see the church of today where they're kind of being apostate and, and they're, uh, they're kind of turning away from God and the way that, that we're kind of, we're kind of disrespecting Christ. You, you see the way churches are? And so it's about the, I don't know, sixth church, I believe, where it talks about the fact that they're not going to have to go through the tribulation. Um, and so we kind of see that there. And so um, I believe that that we are that church that's not going to have to go through the tribulation. And so there are things like that in the Bible that talk about the fact that we're not going to have to go through the wrath. And so when we get there, we're going to see those verses that talk about the fact that we're not going to have to go through God's wrath. We very well may have to go through some pretty difficult times before the rapture. Okay. Um, are they going through difficult times in Israel right now? Yes. Um, are they going through difficult times in um, Ukraine right now? Yes. Um, in North Carolina. Uh, you know, uh, there's, if we think we're going to get by without having to go through difficult times, we're crazy, you know. Um, and so, uh, and also, if you look at, um, um, if you look at the predictions in the Bible, there's a couple of things where it talks about wars and rumors of wars and uh, earthquakes and all that kind of stuff. And, and it talks about it two different places in the Bible. And one of them says, and before these things, such as that's going to happen. And the other place it says, and after these things, such as it's going to happen. And a lot of people think they're talking about the same thing, but they're not. But they sound like they're talking about the same thing, but you have to look and say, this one says before, and this one says after. And you realize, oh, those are two different things. And so you realize, oh, we might have to go through some stuff. Um, but in any case, I think um, I, I can't off the top of my head prove to you um, that we will go before the tribulation. But I believe as we get into the study, I will be able to prove to you through scripture that the rapture will happen before the tribulation. Is that OK? Yes. yes. OK. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a specific verse for you. No, no, no. Um, yeah. But I, I think. As we get into the scripture, we're going to be able to prove it to you. There's yes, sir? There's also a verse that says that God wants a, a church without blemish. I mean, right. there's going to be some people that are, are ready for the rapture, and they're going to go, oh, wow, is that today? Yeah. And it's going to be... Yeah, just like that little dinosaur on top of the rock, and it's raining, and the Noah's Ark's floating away. Oh, is that today? <laughs> No. Turn turn the page uh, on top of 247 and you're going to see a picture. And on top of 247, uh, in Daniel tap, chapter 9, uh, it talks about, um, uh, it gives us the whole outline of what's going to happen. And so Daniel said that we would have the, 60, the, the 70 weeks or whatever. Uh, and so we have 483 years, uh, which ended with uh, the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ riding in. And that was from the declaration of Anaxerxes to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem to the entrance of the Messiah on the triumphant entry was the exact number of days, 483 years, whatever, which was exactly what Daniel said. And so then we have the church age. And so if you look on that little picture, it's the church age is the interval. You everybody see the interval there on top of page 247 in your little handout? You see that, Phil? Interval? Yes. Okay. So the interval is the church age. And you can see the little cross there. That's where Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. And so the church age is the interval. And we see that in verse, I believe, 26 of chapter 9 of Daniel. That's the interval, um, and that's the church age. And then you see where the question mark up there, pre-tribulation, that's where the rapture is going to be, okay? And then you have the 70th week, which is the seven years of the tribulation. 
And then you have the second coming at the end of the tribulation. Okay, that's seven years later. And at the and after the second coming, you then have the millennium, which is the uh, thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And so in that picture you have there, the first one, the first question mark is pre-tribulation. Uh, the second question mark is mid-tribulation. Uh, the third question mark is pre-wrath. And the third, uh, fourth question mark is post-tribulation. And so there are people who believe uh, that the rapture could happen in any one of those four places. I personally believe it's going to happen pre-tribulation. Okay, and I believe I can prove that to you through Scripture that we that Jesus Christ is going to have the rapture before the tribulation, where the first question mark is. Okay, so I believe that at the end of the church age, we'll have the rapture. Then at some point, the tribulation will start, probably almost immediately after the rapture. So you'll have seven years of tribulation. And then you'll have the second coming, which is Armageddon. Okay, the second coming is Armageddon, right? Jesus is going to come down and he's going to kick everybody's butt. And the blood's going to flow as deep as the horse's bits, right? Okay? And then you're going to have the millennial reign where Jesus reigns for a thousand years. Um, it, uh, some people believe that David is going to be resurrected and David will be the one that's sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, reigning for a thousand years. David, David, King David, it and will be some people. Uh, uh, the, for the millennium, it'll be a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, Jesus is going to kick Satan's butt again. Okay, then you're going to have a new heavens and a new earth, and Jesus reigns forever. And that's when Star Trek starts. <laughs> yeah, there's some judgments going on there too. So Satan dies? Satan is put in the lake of fire and it's done away with, yes. Because I thought at one point you said he was chained and then he got back to earth or something. Yeah. 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 If you have your book, on the fourth to the last page, page 292 in your book, I anticipated the fact that you would have these questions. And I put this diagram on page 292 in your book. And you can see there that we have the commandment to restore Jerusalem, which was with the decree of Anaxerxes Logimanus on March 14, 455 B.C. Then you have uh, uh, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt after 49 years, or seven weeks, if you will. Then you have uh, 62 weeks. Uh, and then you have where the Messiah is presented as king at the triumphant entry, which we call Palm Sunday. Okay. Then you have the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the church age interval. Then you have the rapture of the church or the harpazo. You also have the Bema seat judgment right there. You see the Bema seat. Uh, you see the temple is rebuilt and sacrifices are resumed. You have three and a half years of false peace and three and a half years of the great tribulation. You have the second coming of the Messiah and Satan is bound and put in the bottomless pit. Then at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loosed and you have the great white throne judgment and Satan and the unbelievers are sent to the lake of fire. Why in the world is God going to loose Satan again? Just born in the tribulation, in the millennium. 
Yeah, I have no idea why he's going to lose him again. Once you get him in jail, why are you going to let him go? I don't know. I'm not God. I wouldn't have done it. Okay, and so you can, does that kind of make sense for you there? Yes, it does. It does. I but I think it's interesting is that the Antichrist will be revealed almost simultaneously with the rapture. Almost simultaneously. We don't, we don't know exactly uh, when he's going to be revealed, but it'll, it'll most likely be, uh, we don't believe it'll happen until after the rapture. Yes. Um, the Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist going to be? Well, the Antichrist is going to have three, come up with three and a half years of false peace between Israel and all those people around him that hate Israel, which makes us believe that the Antichrist will be half Israeli and half Arab. Arab. Right, he'll be of, of descent of half Israeli and half Arab. Who else could bring those two together? There's, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you think with the chaos that will happen at the rapture, that they'll be ready? The whole world will be ready for anybody that says they can help. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, also, the Antichrist is 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 not the opposite of Christ. It's a false Christ. Okay, so don't get confused. The Antichrist is not the opposite of Christ. It's a false Christ. And he's going to look like Christ. In other words, he's going to die and be resurrected. Now, whether he's going to actually be dead, dead, and Satan's going to use some power to resurrect him, or he's going to be almost dead and they're going to use the paddles on him and, and whatever. You understand what I'm telling you? But he's, he's going to, quote, be resurrected and they're going to say, this is the Messiah. And, and he's going to do things that Jesus did. He's going to perform miracles like Jesus did through the power of Satan. He's going to look like the Messiah and everybody's going to follow him. And that's how he's going to have his power. Okay. And there's going to be three and a half years of false peace while he gets control of everything. And then three and a half years of really, really bad stuff um, as he really reveals himself. True. Question. I have a question about the letter, the letter to the churches. I don't know if I misunderstood or what, but you talked about the letter to the churches, mm -hmm. and we get to them in more detail. But then you said something about the last letter of the church was not blemished, and that's us or something like that. I didn't quite understand all that. That, that only one church was actually going to be raptured. No. So that's I got to. Um. The, if you read the letters to the churches, um, there, uh, there's, and, and I'm doing this from memory, and my prevagen is not working. Uh, there is one letter to a church that is very clearly they're not going to go through the wrath, and there are a couple of churches that they are not making it to heaven. They're they're in deep trouble. And so if you, if you read those things, you're, you're going to get that. And as we study them, we're going to see that. And if you look at them, you're going to see the history of the church. Uh, if you look in the dark ages of the Christian church, and, and I don't want to mention a specific denomination, but the most uh, prevalent one that we remember from church history, um, they did some really bad stuff in 1200, 1300, right? And, and you look at the letters to the churches, you look at them, and it's the history of the church. Uh, it's actually quite amazing. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Uh, Jesus told a story uh, of Lazarus 
uh, who, uh, and this is not the, uh, Mary and Martha's brother. We're talking about Lazarus, the, the poor man who the dog licked his sores and he, he wished he could have the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And the rich man and Lazarus both died. And Lazarus went to uh, Abraham's bosom, the Bible says. And the rich man went to hell. Remember that? And uh, the rich man looked up and saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man uh, said, um, can you, or I guess told Jesus or God, I'm, I'm not sure exactly who he told this to, but he said, can you please have Lazarus uh, get us some water so we can just dip our tongue in that? And, uh, and can you send him back to tell my brothers about this? And Jesus said, man, if somebody just rose from the dead, they still wouldn't believe it, which was kind of interesting because Jesus was going to rise from the dead and they still didn't believe him. Um, and so my, my first thing is, is, yes, the people in hell can see what's going on in the good place. Okay, uh, there's a lot going on there. Um, in the Old Testament, when you died, you went to a place called death. Okay, you didn't go to heaven. You went to a place called death. Um, this is where the idea of purgatory comes from. And the Bible tells us when Jesus died, he went uh, to death and hell. And it says he preached to the prisoners there. And he led the prisoners from death out. Okay? And so when Abraham died, Noah, those people who were faithful, when they died, they went to death. Jesus went and preached to them, and he led them out to heaven. Okay? So when you, if you were faithful and you died, you went to death, Jesus came and preached to you. If you accepted him as Savior, he led you out to heaven. Okay? After Jesus was resurrected, nobody went to death anymore. When you died, you either went straight to heaven or straight to hell. That's what, they, that's what Paul tells us in the New Testament, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Um, so in the Old Testament, you went to death uh, or you went to hell. Um, so your question is, for us, when we die, can we see what's going on in hell? No, we can't. I don't think we can see what's going on in hell. Um, I don't think we can necessarily see what's going on on earth, but I think uh, we can ask Jesus what's going on, and I think he can tell us. Um, I think it's kind of like, the Bible doesn't really tell us about that, so we don't really know. Uh, I suspect it's a lot like, when we get to heaven, it's a lot like being plugged into the network, and I think we'll know everything that everybody else knows. Um, so we probably won't care a lot because we'll be worshiping God uh, and that kind of thing. The Bible tells us that all the tears will be wiped away, but they're not wiped away immediately. And so I believe when we get to heaven, we will have some time to say, oh, I wish I would have told more people about Jesus. I wish I would have done more. And at some point, the Bible says that God will wipe away our tears and, and we won't remember the people that didn't make it to heaven eventually. But at the first part of being in heaven, I think we will remember. Yes, sir. Uh, when the Antichrist is, is like you say, he you know, sounds like Jesus, look like Jesus. Okay, uh, we won't be here, but people that are here then, uh, what do you think God is going to do to the people that follow the Antichrist Okay, the Bible says that if you worship the Antichrist, you're going to hell. That's it. Okay, uh, the Bible says that uh, you can't buy or sell anything unless you take the mark of the beast. Okay, in other words, you have to say, I um, worship the beast. Now, what is the mark of the beast? Well, we don't really know what the mark of the beast is. Um, the Bible tells us that he will have a withered arm and he will have some sort of scar on his head. Okay. Um, some people, uh, have you heard about the idea of putting little computer chips in your hand? Okay. Those computer chips are the same kind of chip that I have in my card right here. It's the same kind of chip. 
This chip identifies me, okay? It does not identify anybody else. It identifies me. So if I have a chip put in my hand, it does not identify the Antichrist. It identifies me. So that is not the mark of the beast because I'm not taking his identity. If I take his identity, then that would be if I took, if I got a tattoo that matched him, that would be taking his mark. In other words, taking the mark of the beast means I'm identifying with him. It's not getting something that's unique to me. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Okay. So the mark of the beast is not something you're going to accidentally take. It's something that you're going to know that you're taking. But you won't be able to buy food at the grocery store. You won't be able to have a job. You won't be able to own property. You won't be able to do, you won't be able to go out in public unless you have this mark of the beast. I don't know what it was. You can imagine during World War II, if you didn't have a Nazi swastika on yourself somewhere, you could not go out in public in Germany or something like that. It'll be that kind of thing, okay? Um, and so if you take, the Bible says, if you take the mark of the beast, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved if you take the mark of the beast. And so the only way to be saved during the tribulation is to make it all the way through the tribulation without taking the mark of the beast or dying for Christ during the tribulation. Start singing, I love Start singing, I love Jesus. What? Start singing, I love Jesus. Start singing, I love Jesus. That's right. Uh, Jesus paid it all. Right. Um, uh, the Bible, we're going to read about this and you can see it. But uh, the Bible talks about the idea of the saints that die during the tribulation. And it says the souls that are under the altar. And those are the people who die during the tribulation. And they're, I'm sorry? The martyrs, the ones who died during the tribulation. And they are crying out to God for justice. When are you going to come and give us our justice? And they're asking Jesus to come to the second coming and, and give them their justice. And those are the people who died for Christ during the tribulation. And um, so it's, yeah, it's going to be ugly. It's going to be so those ugly. Those are people who didn't believe before the tribulation that began to believe when Sorry Bridge just Oh yeah, uh, have you watched that? Uh, what's the movie? Left Behind. Left Behind series. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. There's like you know preachers who are like you know. Oh, I thought I believed. Evidently, I was just faking. You know. The Bible says you'll you know if you did or not. Uh, how, how do you know if you're saved or not? You'll, you'll know by your fruit. Is your love, is your patience, is your kindness, is your goodness real or are you faking it? Is the Holy Spirit coming out of you or are you just pretending to be those things? True. True. That's what uh, Hagee said that. Hagee said people go on a date. He said anybody can be nice for three hours. The real person's at home in a cage. <laughs> Who has a question? Do we beat that horse enough? World leader. World leader. He'll he'll be the person. He he she. Um, I think it's a he. Will be uh, the world leader. Will be the president of the world. The king of the world. But if he looks like Christ and he does the things that Christ did, how will those people identify him as the antichrist? I, I, su I suppose uh, the Holy Spirit will tell him he's not. The Holy Spirit will be there. Uh, 
I don't know if the Holy Spirit will be present or not. I, I guess we talked about that, and I don't remember what the solution was. God's always at work. And and if you can get saved during the tribulation, the Holy Spirit has to be here to lead you to Christ. Uh, I, I, I think the Holy Spirit has to be at work during the tribulation. I think. I mean, I, I'll have to, we'll have to study that, but I'm pretty sure that, that you'll have to depend on the Holy Spirit to tell you. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> questions? No more questions? Okay, so you saw on the top of page 247 uh, the different people or, or the different views that people have of the tribulation, pre, mid, post, uh, and so on. I believe that it's a uh, pre tribulation. Uh, so it, I'm a pre-tribulation, uh, pre-dispensationalist or something like that. Uh, who has a question? No questions. Uh, Matthew, Lion of Judah. Uh, Matthew, a Jewish tax elect- collector, becomes a disciple of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, and ultimately writes a book to his fellow Jews to prove Jesus' kingship. Uh, The most Jewish of the four Gospels sets out to establish the identity and authenticity of Jesus' claim to Messiahship. Uh, Through liberal quotations from the Old Testament, prophets uh, concerning the birth of the Messiah and presentation of genealogy linking Jesus with the Davidic throne, Matthew convincingly places Christ squarely in the context of Israel's history, the King of Kings. He then charts Jesus' miracles, discourses, and parables, moving beyond Israel to all mankind with the gospel. Matthew concludes with a familiar great commission. So you have the genealogy of Jesus there. Um, You have his early years, the preparation for his ministry, the uh, constitution of the kingdom, the Messiah's miracles and powers, uh, the apostles, Increasing opposition, the king announces uh, a new interim form of the kingdom due to Israel's rejection, the Messiah's unwearied grace met by mounting hostility, the king prepares his disciples, the king instructs his disciples, presentation and rejection of the king, the king's Olivet discourse, the king's passion and death, the king's triumph. Um, We can also look at the book through an introduction. You have the genealogy, baptism, and temptations in chapters 1 through 4. The Galilean ministry, you have the tenfold message, the ten miracles, the ten rejections, and then the climax in Judea, the presentation as king, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. It talks about the Magi. You remember the Magi come and see the baby? Uh, Judea was a buffer province between Rome and and the rival Parthenon uh, Empire to the east. The Magi were the hereditary priesthood of the Parthenon Empire. They were the magistrates. So magistrate is kind of a cross between a political ruler and a religious person. Uh, They were the kingmakers of the Parthenon Empire. They're the ones that chose who the next king was going to be. Within this priesthood uh, was a cabal, which were the custodians of the secret prophecy entrusted by Daniel 500 years before. Uh, They came with an armed cavalry escort, which even put Herod on edge. And their question of Herod was, where is he that is born the king of the Jews? This was a a put down. So you recall that Jesus was born... Actually, if we go back a little bit, you recall that the Babylonians came and took captives from Jerusalem and from Israel. And Daniel was one of the ones that they captured. Daniel, being really smart, uh, took him back. And you remember he became 
one of the advisors for the king. You remember this, right? And you remember Daniel was able to interpret the dreams and all that kind of stuff. And the king so liked Daniel that he elevated him up as one of the head muckety-mucks, right? Is that an official word there? Uh, muckety-muck. And made him kind of one of the king's magicians or something. Everybody okay with that? Um, that's kind of a problem, isn't it? Because he's a Hebrew. He's not one of us. And he's one of the big dudes here. Well, Daniel starts getting all this ready. And Daniel knows prophecy. He's the one that wrote Daniel, right? And Daniel wrote all the prophecy about all the stuff that was going to come. And Daniel even told him about, hey, there's a child going to be born, Bethlehem. It's going to be the Messiah, all this kind of stuff. And he started this little group of, uh, I don't know, of uh, little priests or whatever, um, uh, magi, and he told them they're supposed to be watching for this and watching for the star and all that kind of stuff. And sure enough, this happens and the star shows up. The star, anybody know what the star was? Was it a star? Yeah. That's what it says. It says it was a star. I don't think it was a star. I think it was a group of angels. Okay? I think it was a group of angels. How are you going to follow a star? Right? I think it was a group of angels and they just followed it, okay? Um, and so they followed it to Jerusalem. Uh, when they show up, it wasn't just three guys with three camels. It was some really important guys with a whole cavalry of entourage with them. And they show up with Herod and Herod's like, ooh, are these guys coming to tell me they're going to bring an army over here? And they're going to cause a bunch of trouble. And I'm going to be in trouble because Herod wasn't the big, de big deal. He, he was, he was, you know, he was appointed as kind of the king governor guy over this area. He, he had guys above him, right? And so he's afraid that they're going to start something and he's going to be in trouble. And these guys come in and they say, hey, where is the guy who was born king of the Jews? In other words, you were just appointed. You weren't born a king. You just got stuffed into this job when nobody else was standing around here. Where's the guy that was born king of the Jews? Um, and so what happened after that? So they, they looked around and they figured out, oh, it was Bethlehem. And what did Herod tell the Magi? Yeah, after you go see him, come back. Because I want to go worship him, right? So they leave, and what does Herod do? Herod says, kill all the babies two years old and under, right? And so Herod's like, we're going to make sure we get them, right? Uh, the Magi go, and they find Jesus, and they give him uh, uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? Everybody okay with that? How many Magi were there? We don't know. There were three gifts, but we don't know how many there were, okay? Why did they give him gold? He was a king. Frankincense and myrrh, right? One of those is for uh, burial, right? The other one is for what? I forgot. One was because he was a king, one was for his burial, and one was for something else. I don't remember. But they were, it was very appropriate for him being the Messiah. Uh, in any case, it also says that they found Mary and the child in his home. Okay? They didn't find him in a stable. The shepherds found him in a stable. The Magi found him in a home. So they were in, in Bethlehem for almost two years before they had to sneak off to uh, Egypt. Because Joseph was warned in a dream that they were going to be in deep trouble because um, Herod was going to, you know, have a problem. Um, so in any case, in the picture that you have of your nativity, where you have the baby and the lamb uh, and the cow and the llama. <laughs> my sister-in-law, sure, there was a llama there. Uh, in any case, there were, there were no magi. They didn't get there yet, but uh, that's okay if you have one. Uh, in any case, Herod, you know, started all that. Joseph had a dream, went down to Egypt, 
they were down in Egypt until Joseph had another dream. It was okay to go back. And so then they went back to Nazareth, which is where um, uh, they lived. So that's where Joseph and Mary had grown up. Who has a question? Cool. Like one yeah, I think it was a group of angels. <laughs> Most likely, they were all in in a car. Uh, you know, the disciples had a car. Do you know what kind of car they had? It was a Honda. They were all in one accord. <laughs> Yeah. That were genuine I would think so. Yes. I, I would think I would think that they were. I would think that God would not spend time uh, warning them with angels if they were not believers, and I would think that they would not show up with uh, gifts and stuff if they were not serious believers. As a matter of fact, I've been to the Church of the Nativity in uh, Bethlehem, and when you go in, uh, there's kind of a a tall uh, middle section with columns on the side and then lower sections on the side. And in the tall section, there's like windows at the top, but on the sides, there's a mural on the sides. And the, and the mural is these camels with the kings on it, with the magi on the camels. Anybody else seen this before? And uh, it has it on the sides there. And supposedly when the Persians came uh, uh, to Jerusalem, they destroyed, uh, in Bethlehem, they destroyed all the churches except that one. And the reason they didn't destroy it, because there were pictures of Persians on the wall, which was kind of cool. What? They look like them. Yeah. So that's why uh, the Church of the Nativity is the oldest one there, is because they didn't destroy that. So uh, in Matthew, you have the major discourses, which is the Sermon on the Mount, Chapters 5 through 8, uh, it has moral standards and motives. The Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and 25 talks about the second coming uh, and the kingdom parables in Matthew 13. Matthew was a customs official and uh, he would be skilled in shorthand. He could have taken down uh, these um, discourses verbatim uh, the detailed discourses are why his gospel is longer than Mark's. If you took out the discourses in Matthew, Mark's would be longer. And so that's the reason Matthew's is so long. If you look at the seven kingdom parables, the sower and the four soils, you can see that it matches up to the letter to the uh, church at Ephesus in Revelation. And you can see that the tares and the wheat also matches up to the church at Smyrna, and so on. You can see each of the seven kingdom parables match up to the seven churches, which is kind of cool. Matthew 13, uh, 10 says, The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. 
Only those that were believers were able to understand Jesus' parables. The Pharisees accused Jesus at the end of Matthew chapter 12 of doing Satan's work. And after that, he only speaks in parables. We also see that these seven parables parallel the seven churches in Revelation. So what happened was, is they accused Jesus of representing Satan. And so then he starts talking in parables. Uh, so only they could understand. In Matthew 24, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh uh, be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then in Matthew 28, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, which is the um, Great Commission. Um, what are we supposed to do uh, in the Great Commission? Are we supposed to go get people saved? We're supposed to go make disciples. Everybody understand that? We're not just supposed to go get people saved. We're supposed to go make disciples. Questions? Somebody pray for us. Amen. John's going to be ordained as a deacon first service Sunday, so y'all be there to give him condolences or something. Condolences.